according to your wish. Well, praise God, now it is time to start our Bible study as we continue on in the look at the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, this is, I believe, our sixth week in this study. We're looking at the Beatitudes one at a time. And uh, it's just, it's a blessing for you to be here with us. It's a blessing for us, for you to be here with us. I want you to know that, that we appreciate you joining us. Um, this is the ministry that we have here at Bible Talk, is to share God's word, to proclaim God's word, powered by God's love. And it's just, it's a blessing to us to have the technology that allows us to broadcast these Bible studies around the globe through the internet. Uh, so before we start tonight, I'm joined once again by my lovely wife, Alice, and my Hi. brother, Mark Switos. So uh, I'm going to ask Mark if you'll start us with a prayer, and then we'll get right into the study. Oh, Lord, we just thank you that we can study your word in relative free freedom for the time. And just we pray that you open up your heart and pour it in ours and just give us your wisdom and your knowledge that we can go and spread your word more and more. Amen. Amen. Uh, just to, to recap, we've been talking about the Sermon on the Mount as the absolute guideline for the life of a Christian. This is normal Christianity, what Christ proclaims and teaches here in this sermon the most complete sermon that Jesus gave in his three and a half years of ministry that we have recorded. This is his guide to how the righteous should live their lives here on this earth. And while it's, I've said that it's radical, it requires a radical fanatical attitude towards our relationship with Jesus, it is what should be normal Christianity. And I've said, unfortunately, it's not common Christianity today. But we're here because the Word of God is profitable. It's profitable for, for, for it's God breathed, first of all, and God has given it to us for training in righteousness so that we would be equipped for the works that He's calling us to. So, the other thing is, it, it's, I'm blessed that you can be here and join us for an hour of this broadcast, but quite frankly, that's simply not enough. I, I ask that you seriously take what you hear tonight. And I've said this before, if you have questions, if you have comments, if you have suggestions about what we're doing, write to us at office at BibleTalk.com. But meditate on these things during the week. If there's something here that strikes you during the course of this coming hour, spend time with the Lord on that thing and let it ramble around in your spirit throughout this week because things change when you hear the Lord speak to you. All right? Okay, again, it's it's good if you can be prepared to take notes. It's just a, a, a little advice because this is an in-depth study and we go through it. Even though we spend an hour on one verse each week right now, it's uh, we go through it pretty quick. Yes. All right, we're in Matthew chapter 5, verse 7, the Beatitudes. And this week we're looking at, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Mercy. Let's first of all define what it is. I, you know, I start these oftentimes from the dictionary. And the dictionary is not a bad place because words have meaning. And it's not casual and God speaks with purpose. All right. So let me give you, and this is from both the Random House Dictionary and the Collins English Dictionary. Mercy is kindly forbearance shown towards an offender, an enemy, or other person in one's power. The discretionary power of a judge to pardon someone or to mitigate punishment. Compassionate treatment of or attitude towards an offender, adversary, etc., who's in one's power or care. Now, by the way, I'm saying this is the world's dictionary definition. I'm not going to say that I agree with everything as it's written here, right? But it's a good starting point. And one of the things I want you to notice right off the bat is it talks about mercy having to do with your relationship with people who are offenders, mm -hmm. an enemy, mm -hmm. or persons in your power, right? The other thing is said, the discretionary power of a judge to pardon someone or to mitigate punishment. We'll talk about that a little bit here, because 
a judge still has obligation to uphold the law, all right? And I want to start with this verse as we go into it tonight. This is God speaking through the prophet Hosea a long time ago. God says, I, for I desired mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. That's Hosea 6.6. 6. Okay? So mercy, apart from the knowledge of God, is no more than man's attempt at sympathy. It's short-lived at best and lacking in eternal effect and durability. What I'm saying is mercy that Jesus wants in our hearts has to be combined. It has to be mercy combined with the knowledge of God. Because otherwise you're going to lean on your own understanding. You're not going to understand what God's mercy is about. And what you're going to, what you're going to put out as mercy not is not God's. How important is this? Did you pay attention to what this started with? Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Well, the opposite side of that coin is, if you are not merciful, God's saying to you, you're not going to receive mercy. I've said this before. I'm going to say it again. Maybe I, if, if the Lord should bless me to remember, I will say this every study we have in the Sermon on the Mount. There's not a single suggestion in it. From Matthew 5 to Matthew, the end of Matthew 7, Jesus Christ does not make a single suggestion. These are the commands of God. All right? All right, so if we're going to talk about mercy. You have to start in the right place. All right? And the beginning of this, the right place to start is having an understanding of the mercy seat. Back in Exodus, in the wilderness, God commanded Moses, Aaron, right? to build the Ark of the Covenant. Yes. The Ark of the Covenant, which was the focal point of worship for the people of God for so long, right? Yes. I want to read this to you, and this is from Exodus uh, 20, chapter 25. I'm going to read from verse 17 to 22. You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold, two and a half cubits long and one and a half cubits wide, you shall make two cherubim of gold. Make them of hammered work at the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub at one end and one cherub at the other end. You shall make the cherubim of one piece with the mercy seat at its two ends. The cherubim shall have their wings spread upward, covering the mercy seat with their wings and facing one another. The faces of the cherubim are to be turned toward the mercy seat. You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark. And in the ark, you shall put the testimony which I will give to you. There I will meet with you. And from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim which are on the ark of the testimony, I will speak to you about all that I will give you in commandment for the sons of Israel. Okay? The ark of the covenant. This is about God's forgiveness. In the Old Testament, they had, and Jewish people today still practice this, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, that one holiest day in their calendar when the high priest would enter and he alone could go in and he could only go in on the Day of Atonement. He could enter into the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was, where the mercy seat was. And he would take the blood that had been gained from the unblemished land outside and he would carry that blood in and he would sprinkle it on the mercy seat for the atonement of sins. Mm -hmm. Right? Because the law says without the sh shedding of blood, there is no atonement. The thing about the mercy seat was this is the place that God said, I will meet with you and I will speak with you. Okay? That's going to be the focal point of our study. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to tell you that the, the, the Hebrew word that's used here for the mercy seat is kapareth. Mm -hmm. All right? Now, again, you don't have to be a scholar of language to get this, but it's important that you pay attention to this because, again, the words are important. Yes. Now, I don't know if you know what the Septuagint is. It's abbreviated, it's a Bible translation abbreviated LXX, which is Roman, for, Roman numerals for 70, right? Mm -hmm. That was a Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures. It was made by rabbinical scholars or Hebrew scholars 
a couple of hundred years before the birth of Christ. So these are people that are very close to this, right? Mm -hmm. Very knowledgeable. But because this is now the Greek Empire had spread throughout the world, right? Alexander the Great. And to make the scriptures more accessible to all of the, the Jews that had already been dispersed and who were speaking Greek because that was becoming the common language of the, of the land, they translated scripture into Greek. When they translated Exodus and talked about the mercy seat, they used the word hilasterion. There's a reason for me telling you this. And by the way, in Latin, that same word, this was what was used in the Vulgate, the Latin Vulgate translation, was propitiatorium. I hope I'm not boring. Pay attention. Pay attention, I tell you. The caporet, this mercy seat, the place where God and man meet, Paul in Romans, which is the letter exposing righteousness, faith, grace, mercy. This is what Paul wrote in his third, in the third chapter of his letter to the Romans. Because of the works of law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom, listen to this now, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation. Now the Greek word that Paul used there is hilasterion. And the translation propitiation is the same word as the Latin propitiatorium, right? So God displayed Jesus publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. Jesus Christ is the mercy seat, the caporet. He is the hilasterion. That's what Paul is. Paul, there is no more scholarly writer in the New Testament than the Apostle Paul, a Pharisee among Pharisees. So when he writes that Jesus, God displayed him as the hilasterion, trust me, Paul knows he is referring to the, to the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies on the Ark of the Covenant, right? Listen to these other verses. This is Hebrews, Hebrews 2.17. Therefore he, Jesus, had to be made like his brethren in all things, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. In 1 John, John writes, and he himself is, talking about Jesus, he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the whole world, right? Later on, in the fourth chapter of 1 John, he writes, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. These writers in the New Testament when they make this reference and use the word hilasterion, which is translated propitiation, they know that they are referencing that one place that is the most holy on all the faces of the earth to the Jews, the Ark of the Covenant, the, and not just the Ark of the Covenant, but specifically that place in the Ark of the Covenant where God and man come together and meet. Jesus is literally the place where God Almighty and man meet for the forgiveness of sin, mercy. That was the purpose. You see, what was in the Ark of the Covenant? The law. All right? So you have the law, and on top of the law, you have this mercy seat. I'm going to talk more about that. But I want to talk more because I want us to get an idea, a really clear picture of God's mercy and come to an understanding of it. Because the fact is, I don't think we have a great understanding of mercy. We have a lot of kind of vague ideas and worldly ideas about it. But I want us to really get in here tonight. I'm going to read from John chapter 8, starting in verse 2. And early in the morning, 
This is it. Jesus came again into the temple, and all the people were coming to him. And he sat down and began to teach them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. And having set her in the midst, they said to him, Jesus, Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. What then do you say? And they were saying this, testing him, in order that they might have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. But when they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. And he stooped down again and wrote on the ground. And when they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones. And he alone was left with the woman where she was in the midst. And straightening up, Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go your way. From now on, sin no more. There is no better picture of mercy in Scripture than that. But I want to talk about this. I mean, we could do Bible studies on just that one passage. But let's just look at something here. First of all, the Pharisees were wrong, by the way. Because if somebody was caught in adultery, both the man and the woman had to be brought for trial, not just the woman. So once again, they're going by their tradition because it had become in the in this Pharise how do you say Pharisaical? Pharisaical. Pharisaical. In this silly religious atmosphere that they had created, it had become so male dominant which scripture is not contrary to most people's opinion. And they were kind of excusing the male and putting all of the onus and the blame on the woman. Well, the law required that both of them be brought forth. So they weren't following the law, but they were following their tradition. Just, point. Just so you know it. Because I want you to be aware of the fact that Jesus Christ never, never, never broke the law. Never, never, never. All right. So now... He, by this process, and we're not going to get into what, what he wrote and what he did, but the fact is, he confronts, and remember, they're only doing this to trap, their interest is not the woman. And it's interesting because if they, I doubt that they would court her in the morning. So if they caught her in the evening, they held her to bring her to wait for an opportunity to confront Jesus, because this is not about the woman caught in adultery. This is about Jesus. They're trying to trap him once again. All right. They have no mercy. They didn't care about the woman at all. And they have no mercy towards Jesus Christ. So Jesus now, he turns to this woman and he says, you know, where are those who condemn you? And he says, I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. Well, let me ask you a question. Did she sin by committing adultery? Yes. All right. Now, there's no denial of the fact that she committed adultery. So she was caught in the act of adultery. All right. Mm -hmm. Did she sin? then where is the punishment? The wages of sin is death. I mean, the law, the law, while it is harsh, and Jesus is bringing mercy, because remember, the mercy of God in the temple is covering the law. Yes. The mercy seat sits on top and covers the law. However, Jesus never broke the law. So when Jesus tells her, first of all, Again, this is not a suggestion. He's not saying, well, you'll do better if you go. He is commanding her. Sin he is absolutely giving her a command to change her life and go and sin no more. So now, has she gotten away? And this is a serious question because it's about mercy. Does the mercy of Jesus Christ mean that she got away with committing sin and there was no penalty paid? No. He took Aha. Aha. That's exactly right. I want you to see something because this is a facet of mercy. Don't think that mercy doesn't come without cost. Let me read you one more verse before I go on because I've been confronted with this verse because people say that I'm judgmental. No, I'm serious about the word of God. This is from James chapter 2. 
For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy. Now, I want to say that again. Judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy. Jesus said, you're blessed if you are merciful, because you will receive mercy. The other side of that is, if you don't show mercy, this is God saying to you, you will receive no mercy. But then James goes on to say, mercy triumphs over judgment. Now, I don't particularly like that translation. What, what, what verses were those? In? That's James 2, chapter 2, verse 10 to 13. Because it's not so much that, that mercy puts aside judgment or conquers it, but mercy rejoices that there's a way that the law is dealt with, judgment is dealt with. What Alice said is absolutely true. Listen to this. This is so important for your understanding of mercy, for my understanding of mercy. Mercy does not abrogate or invalidate justice. And God is both just and merciful. He is a just and a merciful Savior. Isaiah 45. Now this is going back 2,700, 2,800 years. God spoke and he said this. Declare and set forth your case. Remember I talked last in our last session about the, you know, how he is this legal approach to God? Declare and set forth your case. Indeed, let them consult together. Who has announced this from old? Who has declared it? Is it not I, the Lord? And there is no other God besides me, a just God and a Savior. There is none except me. God is both just and the Savior. Savior, he's offering his mercy, right? But Jesus did not erase the punishment for sin in the case of this woman. He chose to take it upon himself. Because when he died on that cross, when he was beaten, when he was scourged, when he was mocked, when he was crucified, died, he was paying the price for that woman's adultery. Mercy like God's love, I mean, it doesn't come for free. It's a free gift to us, but it costs somebody something. Mercy, now I said the mercy seat is where God and man meet, right? Mercy is where law and grace meet. Now, that's something you ought to write down so you get it into your head. Mercy is where grace and law meet, where they come together. The law which requires death as a payment for sin is not broken by grace. It transfers the punishment. The payment is always required. And the Father's mercy places that judgment, that penalty, that death on Jesus. Mercy is where grace and law and grace law. meet. Yeah. The price is always paid and justice is always done. Always done. Mercy does not abrogate, doesn't put aside, doesn't invalidate justice. That's why so much, so many people that I know have problems with mercy because they think that it does. It, they think, well, this is just not fair. Justice is not being done. Justice is always done. Paul wrote again in Romans, in Romans chapter 12. Are you, I'm sure you've heard this. I pray that you've heard this. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you heap burning coals upon his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The thing is, God is bringing the payment, the penalty for sin, for crime, always. But because he's doing it, and it doesn't fall upon us to bring that, we have the we have the freedom to be merciful. Jake, 
You said that we have the freedom to be merciful, but God pays, or that Jesus paid the price. Uh -huh. Because uh -huh. you can't get away with it. Somebody's got to pay the price. Yeah, but that's, that's close. I said that in the case of the woman, Jesus chose to pay the price. Right. But here, let me just say this now. He doesn't pay the price for everybody's sin. Oh, oh he, is, he is willing to pay the yes. price for everybody's sin. The, the deal yeah, is... They ask for it. Right. Our being merciful in the face of evil does not mean that evil is not dealt with. To the one who accepts the grace of God, the vengeance of the Lord will fall, mm -hmm. but it has fallen on Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's why Isaiah wrote, God spoke to Isaiah. This is the logic, the beauty of the logic of Scripture, right? This is why Isaiah wrote 2,700 years ago, speaking of Jesus, the coming Messiah, then he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. Isaiah 53. This still have a question. When we show mercy to somebody else, we are letting we're we're saying that debt is canceled. Uh, Somebody, so, somebody's got to, when it comes to a crime that's committed, somebody's got to pay the penalty for the crime. But it could be a debt. Absolutely. And, so can, wait, okay. But see, the person that that person owes money, if that person owes me money, I could show mercy to him and I can cancel the debt. I'll pay for what he owes me. I'll just cancel it out. I'm able to do that because he owes me the money. But if he did something to somebody else, you can't give him I can't give him mercy. The person that yeah. he did it against has to. Okay, so me, it's me. hard for a judge to show mercy on a person that committed a crime against somebody else. No, because the judge is there as the expression of the fulfillment and the application of law. He's not taking sides for anyone. That this is this is what justice is about. That he is not there representing his own interests or the interest of this person versus this person. He is there. He is there to be the representative of fairness in law. That the law is applied the way the law was written. Now, unfortunately, we don't. You know, I mean, that all too often in our in our society and around the world, you see that failing. But that's what God doesn't fail. And God watches over his word to perform. So the law is always rightly applied. The thing is, when we talk, and, and by the way, it's it's one thing to say some, remember I started this thing by saying that mercy is about your relationship with somebody who's an enemy. Right. It's not about somebody who's a friend. It's somebody who has done wrong to you. Right. That's when mercy comes into play. We're not talking about just being yeah, compassionate. Yeah. Yeah. With the, with the guy you see who's in need of food, which we are supposed to be. We are supposed to be compassionate and feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit the prisoners and sick. But that's not about mercy. What we're talking about with mercy is different than that than compassionate. Mercy is about a relationship with somebody who has done wrong. And somebody may not have paid you a debt that they owed you. But the fact of the matter is, think of the words of David when he committed sin against other human beings mm -hmm. and yet he turns to God and says against you only Lord have I sinned mm -hmm. we need to understand that and, and again I'll go back to the logic of the word of God Jesus Christ said what you've done to the least of my brethren you've done to me it's all sins against God we it's not so much we're supposed to be merciful but more often than not and I'll get into this I pray before we finish up in this session. We're not bringing the mercy. We're bringing the message of mercy. Now, are we supposed to, does mercy involve forgiveness? Absolutely, positively, absolutely. And how many times are we supposed to be forgiving people? It's like this. Now, remember what I said. He's saying, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. It's said in James, if you don't give mercy, you're not going to receive mercy. Later on, and I, I've said that the Beatitudes are the sermon, and everything else in the Sermon on the Mount is commentary on the Beatitudes, right? When Jesus teaches the disciples how to pray, he says, pray this way. 
And what he's asking in that prayer, we're, we're, we're supposed to go before God the Father and say, Father, I want you to forgive me the same way I have forgiven others. This is what Jesus is teaching. Because if we don't forgive, we will not be forgiven. And this is a great problem. Because forgiveness is such a horrible issue in the world today, but even in the church. And everyone makes excuses for why they don't forgive. Oh, you don't know what this person, who cares what they did to you? When they have done to you what they did to Jesus, totally unjustified, when they beat you, when they place a crown of thorn on your heads, when they bring you out naked in the public and mock you, when they take you and make you carry a cross up a dirty, dusty little road up to the cross and then nail you to that cross, you're still expected to forgive. Don't tell me there's never an excuse not for you to forgive. God says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. Don't you be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. There is never an excuse for you not to be merciful. There is never an excuse for you to forgive. We don't know how many... So this is what Peter was like. This is why I love Peter. Peter, I can say, he's like me. He comes and he says to Jesus, you know, this is one, if they only had home movie cameras back then, I would love to have seen Peter come up to Jesus. How many times do you expect me to forgive? Seven times? I mean, somebody comes and I forgive them and they go out and do the same thing over again and I forgive them again. Oh, what a saint I am. And they come back and they do the same thing. I forgive him again. What a saint I am. How many times? Seven times? And Jesus said, no. Seven times seven. Now I'm going to paraphrase that to put it the way exactly the way he means it. One more time. Always one more time. Forgive. This is about, if you don't forgive, you'll not be forgiven. If you're not merciful, you'll not receive mercy. We, there, this is... Remember I said this is about the Beatitudes are about the behaviors and the attitudes that Christ defines to be living righteous, righteously. So when somebody does something against you, you're supposed to let it slide. Well, so it's, that will be taken care of one way or the other. No, okay, this is part of the problem. No, you're not, when you say let it slide, you're saying you're supposed to be inactive. Well, you have to be active to forgive them. You have to. God's forgiveness is active. Mm -hmm. Look at the cross. Mm -hmm. His forgiveness is active. Okay. You have to express that. And you, this, your, your opportunity to forgive somebody is your opportunity to share and show, to demonstrate the love of God. You are supposed to do something. In return for what they have done, you're supposed to love them. That's not letting it slide. That's not being inactive. You're supposed to. This is what Paul said in Romans chapter 12. If your enemy is hungry, give him something to eat. You are supposed to be active in doing this. It's not doing nothing. It is doing something godly. It is loving in return for hate. It is blessing in return for cursing. It is the Sermon on the Mount. Because if you don't do something, it'll fester. It'll fester, and you know what? You're, you're absolutely right. You have to take action. If not, listen, you're right. It'll fester, and bitterness will arise. And, and the Word of God says, don't, don't, don't let bitterness arise. Okay? Because bitterness will not hurt the person who has offended you. It'll hurt you. This is about righteousness. It is about living the way we're not living. This is why it is so important in these last days, and yes, my dear brother or sister, these are the last days, that we learn that we are trained in righteousness. That's what we talked about last, I think the last week, right? Or the last session. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And I said, that this is, this is scripture, this is God speaking, this is the word of God made flesh, manifested. Paul wrote, all scripture is God breathed and profitable for training in righteousness. 
This is Jesus Christ training us in righteousness. We need to, we need to see everything that happens in our life as opportunity. To, I'll say it again, to share and demonstrate the love of God. But know that justice will be done. And when you pray, what you're basically praying for, think of the horror of this. You're praying that God, don't bring your judgment. Do something, God, so you don't have to bring your judgment on that person who has been so horrible to many. Bring that judgment on your son, your blameless son, your only begotten son, he who knew no sin. Bring that penalty on the head of your son, Jesus Christ. And save the other guy. And save the other guy. If we started to live and learn that, I promise you it would change the way you see your Savior and your salvation. So there, there's no such thing as a, a Christian that carries a grudge. There can't be. That's an oxymoron. Uh, that, that is indeed an oxymoron. That's an oxymoron. Yes. You're absolutely right. It's, 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 it's a contradiction in terms. Okay. But righteousness and this mercy is all about trusting in God. Right? Again, I'll read you another. This is a, a, an account that Jesus told. Luke chapter 18. He, he told this account. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Now, by the way, they didn't like the IRS any more then than we do today. So a tax collector, I mean, he is picking the epitome of what we don't like, the bad guy. So he says, one, one with Pharisee and one a tax collector are in there to pray. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, swindlers, un unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all I get. But that tax collector standing some distance away was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this is what Jesus said. I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. Luke 18, 10 to 14. It's about trusting in the mercy of God. It's being able to throw yourself on the mercy of God. It's not about what you do. God, go back to Isaiah again. In Isaiah 58, I think it is, it says, your, your good works are as filthy rags in the sight of God. It's about you throwing yourself at the mercy of God. I had a brother call me from, from England. I think it was this morning, right? Mm -hmm. And he's asking me just, you know, how you, how you respond when somebody says to you, God helps those who help themselves. And so many people believe that's in the Bible. That is absolutely positively not in the Word of God. It does not say anywhere that God helps those who help themselves. I will tell you what the Bible reveals. From Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, what it reveals is this. God helps those who call, who cry out for help to him. Because God is merciful, but God is just. Mercy, now I've said, right, the, the mercy seat is where God and man meet. Mercy is where the law and grace meet. Mercy is where the humble and the king meet. Where the king of the Lord. I'm going to read you another account, and this comes from the Gospel of John, John 5, 2. Now, there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool, which is, in called, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porticos. In these lay a multitude of those who were sick, blind, lame, and withered, waiting for the moving of the waters. For an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever then first, after the stirring up the water, stepped in, was made well from whatever disease which he was afflicted with. A man was there who had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time in that condition, he said to him, do you wish to get well? And the sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. And Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your pallet and walk. Immediately, <clears throat> the man became well and picked up his pallet and began to walk. Jesus had mercy on that man, 
had compassion and mercy on that man. You know what gets gets me about this? What? Nobody else did. But you know what gets me about this? What? You know what Bethesda means? What? It's Hebrew for house of mercy. But nobody, nobody, be close. They were nobody not, saw this person. Oh, and, no, no, no. They, were, they saw him. They saw him they he was there for all the time. Yeah. First John says our goal of the goal of our instruction is love. If a person really loved him, they they would have stopped and helped him in, but they don't. To, um, instead of themselves. But they wouldn't, because they don't have that love. They didn't have that compassion, nor did they have that mercy. Right? But Jesus did. But it's interesting to me that, you know, this happened in a place called the House of Mercy. This is where God would send an angel to stir up the waters. The word Beth, now Beth, Beth says, right? Beth is the Hebrew word for house. But it, and it's used in combination typically with another word, as, as with above, with Bethesda. Um, or like Bethlehem, Bethlehem, Lehem is the word for bread, so it's a house of bread, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I actually, I have, I pastored a church in New York uh, that we started in the late 70s, and the name of that church was Beth the Bar, which is Hebrew for house of the word. Now, that stirred up a lot of things because people back then didn't understand why I would use that, and they said, well, why did you name, why did you name the church after some girl, right? Beth the Bar. That, that led to some interesting stories, but that's, a, that's another story, as they say. But again, and then when we came to Florida, we had a, a church which was called, in English, the Sanford House of Praise. Yes, but, the, but, but the corporate name was actually Beth Hallel, House of Praise. Right? But Beth doesn't just mean uh, a house the way we use the term today. Now, there's a guy, Aria Utenbugard of Abraham Publications, that's a Norwegian name. And, and he says, he's an, a scholar on language here. And he says, the fundamental meaning of the word Beth appears to be a kind of enclosure specifically for keeping, safekeeping, or containing, and is contrasted by a wide array of specialized words, meaning any kind of specific habitat, ranging, ranging any place from, from tents to a palace. Right? But the interesting thing and the thing that struck me there was it's an enclosure specifically for safekeeping or containing, you know, God, God is our, our bait. Bait is the way you say it in Hebrew. He is that enclosure for us. The Lord is the place that we come to, that enclosure. David knew this so well. In Psalm 18, David said, the Lord is my rock. And my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield and horn of my salvation, my stronghold. He called him my fortress, my refuge, my stronghold. These are places you get into for safety, right? And in Psalm 91, he said, I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God, in whom I trust. Jesus Christ, the mercy of God, gives us a place to run into for safety. And that's what we're supposed to bring as an offering to people when we extend the mercy of God. We are offering them refuge, not in us, but in the Christ whom we represent because we are ambassadors for Jesus Christ, right? We, we're called to extend the mercy of God. To, I was going to say to give the mercy of God, but we don't really give it because it's not our mercy. We are extending his mercy to others. This statement of Jesus, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mer mercy. It's about giving and receiving the mercy of God. But you can't give what you don't have. Mm -hmm. And this is why, why I started in the beginning by saying that mercy without the knowledge of God is at best, you know, human sympathy. It doesn't have any long-lasting effect, right? Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Quick? Um, is mercy something that's you give when somebody asks for it? I, I did, I'm going to tell you something. Jesus Christ hung on a cross. And he looked out across, across the centuries. He looked out across the globe. And he looked at me and then turned his eyes to the Father and said, Father, forgive them. I didn't ask for it. 
You offered me that mercy and paid the price for that mercy before I asked. We know love by this, the word of God says, that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. No, we don't have to wait for somebody. We can offer it to them. All right? You can offer mercy. No, you must offer mercy. We are ambassadors for Jesus Christ. We're supposed to be begging people to be reconciled to God. That's what Paul wrote, right? That's what I know you like that verse a lot. Yes. Pleading with them, begging them to be reconciled. Mm -hmm. well, what we're doing is what we're, what we're pleading with, and can you see it any other way? We're, we're pleading with them, accept the mercy of God poured out on that little hill 2,000 years ago. He has poured out his love. He has poured out his mercy. Accept this. So we're going to them before. That woman came. She didn't come to that place, the woman caught in adultery, to receive the mercy of God. She was dragged there to be, to be stoned to death. But Jesus Christ reached out to her and offered her the mercy, the compassion, the love, the forgiveness of God the Father that he would pay the price for on that cross. So God said, you know, don't be, God, yes. Paul wrote to the Galatians and he said, don't be deceived. God is not mocked. For as a man sows, so shall he reap. So when we put out mercy, we receive mercy. Right? But, but it you, can't be, it can't, it's not anything that we have. It's not that's what I'm saying. Mercy. That's why I said you can't give what you don't have, and you can't have it unless you've received it. Because the mercy that we're talking about is a love that you don't have, except for the fact that exactly Paul wrote again in Romans, in Romans chapter 5, and he said that the love of God has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Well, that love is the font, the fountain of God's mercy. So we can't take credit for it. We didn't generate this. We didn't sit down and become nice people. We didn't figure this out or work this out. God gave this to us and said, now, okay, go and share this. But we're not always walking in that. Well, shame on you. <laughs> what do you want well, me to well, say? I think it was that the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Well, yeah, when are, we, when are we not supposed to have the fruit of the Holy Spirit? But we lose it. The other way, I... Oh, I because I, I am embarrassed that, that you have heard my wife confess to such evil. No, because when, when you did. Yeah, because when you're, you, 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 you said the same thing. You lose your patience or your joy, your peace, your gentleness. And if you're not acting. Are you boasting those, or repenting? I'm just saying. No, no. Oh, no, 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 no. Wait a minute. I said, I gave you a choice. <laughs> and you're, you're avoiding the choice. Are you, are you boasting or repenting? Yes. <laughs> Am I boasting that I lost it? Well, yeah, are you? Because the only two choices are you either going to brag about the fact. No. No. You're either going to brag about the fact that you're a dirty, rotten sinner, or you're going to repent of being a dirty, rotten sinner. If you, There is no excuse for losing no, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Of course there is. But, so, that, but isn't this the bat daily battle? I'm sorry, you've got to be We have the flesh and the spirit. There's a conflict. Yeah. Constant between the flesh and the spirit. Yes, Constantly. there is. But, you know. Paul said, I walk always in the triumph of Christ Jesus. We have to learn to walk in the triumph of Christ Jesus and overcome these things. Absolutely. It is a matter of the spirit is supposed to rule our lives, not the flesh. Right. So you, there's never a justification for saying, okay, you know, uh, this, you don't, stop making excuses because excuses are fiery the fiery arrows, arrows shot from the pits of hell to, to kill, kill repentance. repentance. Don't make excuses for your failings. Now, we all fall short of the glory of God. We all make mistakes. There's no doubt about that. But here's the joy that we have. If we're faithful to confess that sin, and that's what it is, then he is faithful to forgive. He's faithful and righteous to forgive that sin. So this is why I, I'm, I'm hoping, see, Alice is doing this by, by way of being faithful to the word of God, which says, confess your sins one to another. Because well, actually, actually, I do, I have to say, that every, well, at night I pray for the Holy Spirit to fill me up again with the fruits. Because somewhere along the day, you lose one, you lose them all. How many miles do you get to the fruit? <laughs> we all, this is why good fellowship is important. 
So we are constantly encouraging one another day by day while it's still cold today to be walking according to the Spirit. And this is why Christ has given us this instruction on the Sermon on the Mount. So we know how to walk righteously. Because I'm going to tell you something. The world didn't train you for this. The world doesn't train you on how to live righteously. When you go to that public school and parents, when you send your children, your lovely little God-given gift children into that filthy, rotten, despicable place they call public education, where all they do is train kids in the ways of the world. Oh. Well, Mark mentioned in, in- I wasn't good with my rant, but that's right, go ahead. In the, with the pull of that Seder, uh, all these people were there and saw him and didn't do Ignore it. him. Why? Wait, you know what made me think of- For their own benefit. Well, what made me think of, we live in Florida, which is warm weather, <clears throat> and what do we, I think more than most places, see out in the streets a lot? Homeless. Homeless people. Well, now, you're, 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 you're right, we see it a lot here, but not more than other places. I'll tell you the truth, okay. not more than Okay. So, so anyhow, let me get back on track here a little bit, right? It's, we don't earn the mercy of God. I've said that pretty clearly, mm -hmm. right? But we are, having received it from him, we're supposed to be faithful stewards yes. of that gift of mercy, mm -hmm. right? This is what Peter wrote. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So we've received it. Now we have to be good stewards of it. God supplied the mercy that we are now to sow, which will reap more mercy. Right? Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. Second Corinthians chapter 9. So what it's saying is, you know, it's not about you having it growing. It's about God giving you the seed that you then take out and plant so that it will grow ever bigger. So that there'll be more of it. Right? When Peter questioned Jesus about how many times he must forgive, it was seven times, right? So after that account, now we talked about that. Then Jesus told the parable. And here was the parable. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves, with his servants. When he had begun to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. But since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had and repayment to be made. So the, so the servant fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. And the Lord of that servant felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. What did I say before? Mercy goes to the one who cries out for mercy. Yes. Right? Okay, but that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And he seized him and began to choke him, saying, pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, have patience with me and I will repay you. But he was unwilling and went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. So when his fellow slaves saw what happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. Jesus said, my heavenly father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. From whom much has been given, much is required. I don't believe that we comprehend yet how much we have been given as the gift of God expressed in Jesus on the cross, the forgiveness. We are now responsible to share that. When you fail to forgive, when you fail to show mercy, when you fail to have compassion, you are doing what this worthless slave did. 
That's dangerous. Oh, so dangerous. So let the Spirit of God tweak your brain, your memory, your spirit, and remind you that you are to be, to have the same attitude as Jesus Christ. I want to kind of get into the end of this by talking about this, the parable of the good and faithful servant. I do seminars, as many of you know, on biblical principles in the workplace. They're called uh, seminars, teachings for, for personal and professional growth. And one of the first things I have to do is define success. Originally, when we started these some 20 years ago, we, we called them uh, seminars for biblical seminars for success in the workplace. And I found that really didn't work because people would come to these seminars and their idea of success, and if you take 100 Christians and ask 100 of them what success is, you'll get 100 entirely different definitions. Uh, but mo unfortunately, most of it has to do with worldly stuff, right? For a Christian, there is only one, solo uno, one definition of success. The ultimate definition for, for, of success for a Christian is this. In Matthew 25, 21, in this parable of the good and faithful servant, Jesus said, his master called, said to him, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. At the end of the day, when you come face to face with Jesus Christ, if you do not hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I don't care what you left in the bank account behind because you're not taking it with you. I don't care what you, what you did in this planet. If you don't hear those words, you're a failure. Our life here is about pleasing the one who we call Lord. We are now his ambassadors with a ministry of reconciliation. The purpose and manifestation of God's mercy. That's the purpose. We, not a church building, are the place, the temple of the Holy Spirit where the lost can meet God. We've talked about the God and man. We've talked about where the law and grace meet. We've talked where the humble and the king meet. But the place that the lost will meet Jesus Christ is in you because you're an ambassador for Jesus Christ. And everything that you do represents the kingdom of God for good or bad. Please remember that. I quoted a verse before and I want to end with this verse. But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifest through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. It's about the mercy of God and the knowledge of God. When they come together, what power there is to change the lives around us and what power there is to change our lives. God demands he expects, but he demands that you bring the mercy that you have received out into that cold, dark world and bring that mercy to others. And you shall receive mercy. So, Father, we just thank you, Lord God. We thank you so much, Lord, that you gave the gift of your Son, Christ Jesus. We didn't deserve it. We didn't earn it. There was nothing that we did that would justify that other than the gift of your love. That he came and did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. Your mercy was poured out when he prayed to you or hang on that cross. Father, forgive them. So Lord, we just thank you for that. And I pray that we would now be faithful stewards of that gift that you gave us. And that we would bring your love. We would bring your word. We would bring you your mercy into the world to touch others in jesus name well next time we'll be looking at blessed are the pure in heart and you don't want to miss that i don't want to miss that and i know i'll be there so until then god bless you and may he use you for the glory of his name
Took